What's going on, Reds fans, and what's going on, baseball fans? Thank you so much for joining me today here on the Locked on Reds podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Carr. Today, we're going to talk about a Cincinnati Reds victory. They're getting out of Milwaukee with a little bit of pride, a little bit of bounce back. They were able to beat the Brewers 5-1. to one. We're going to talk about what happened in that game, a couple of takeaways I've got for you. And I've got some thoughts on Reds chasing awards. We're going to talk about that and preview Wade Miley and Zach Thompson down in Miami. That's all coming up on today's Locked On Reds podcast that is brought to you by Spotify Green Room. Make sure you download that Spotify Green Room app and join me next week. I, I had a room yesterday that I kind of forgot about, and then shout out to Chad and Lancaster. He kind of reminded me, and we got it going. But I'm going to try and do one next week during a evening game whenever everyone can join in, and we're going to have a lot of fun. That's the Spotify Green Room app. They're changing the way that we talk sports. You are locked on Reds. Your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That was a good win for the Red Legs to bounce back, just kind of in the season series with a little bit of pride. I know that the Brewers ultimately won that season series, but it is now officially just 10 to 9. The Brewers had 10 wins, the Reds had 9 wins, and based on the way that the Reds had performed recently against the Brewers, that might have surprised you, the fact that the Reds only lost the season series by one game. And it was one Sonny Gray who had a great game. I mean, another wonderful performance. He is starting to round into form. He's now got 13 straight scoreless innings in his last two starts. I think that throughout his entire season, he's been ramping up, dealing with injuries, then having to shut it down, rehab, then come back, ramp up again. I think now he has finally hit that plateau of goodness where he can be ace 1B. Love to see what he brought to the table was really getting a lot of called strikes. It wasn't a matter of confounding hitters with swings and misses. It was he was painting the black, and a lot of that was from his curveball. He was hitting a ton of corners with that curve in a great uh, way to just kind of keep the Brewers hitters off balance. Nobody really looked comfortable. Now, Aviciel Garcia, he still had a multi-hit game, but, I mean, you're just getting out of there and you're done with facing him. That's fine. He was able to limit whatever damage Garcia did because they were just both singles. But, but still, a good game for Sonny Gray. And then also Jonathan India, a great multi-hit game. He led off the game with a single. He was able to come around via a couple of different at-bats to third and scored on a Joey Votto sack fly. That was the only run for the Reds for a little while before they got up on the board again later on in the game whenever India hit a three-run home run. He was all over the place. And honestly, at this point, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, but even just from, I think, an unbiased perspective, I think he's got to be the favorite to win the NL Rookie of the Year. Absolutely phenomenal. The two-hit game kind of snapped a bit of a skid that he was in. He was three for 25 heading into yesterday's game, and he had a two-hit day. It was, it was good to see because you kind of wonder. He's taken a lot of nicks. In fact, he got hit on the wrist real hard. In the game uh, on, wow, I'm, I'm losing track of days. On Wednesday night's game, he got hit on the wrist really hard. You thought he might come out of the game. Trainers looked at him for a minute. He even went into the clubhouse an inning later to get examined for it. But overall, he was able to stay in the game, and he played well yesterday. Dude is the master. That's one thing. If for some reason he gets cheated out of the NL Rookie of the Year, there's one thing that's completely undisputable. He is the master of grit. Dude is just the grittiest dude that ever gritted, and I love it. And then, not to be outdone, a guy who, if you look at the box score, he only pitched two-thirds of an inning. And if you really dig into it, he didn't throw that many pitches. But Justin Wilson had a very nice performance there in the seventh inning because Tony Santian, who really struggled, he gave up a home run to Luis Sirius, and after he did that, he was just pitching really, really, really carefully to the point that he was giving up walks and not throwing a lot of strikes. <laughs> and shout out to Chris on Twitter. He says, every time you say you like a pitcher, that pitcher then stinks for a while. So, yeah, I, I said I like Tony Santian, and he had a really bad performance there. But 
Justin Wilson came in and bet and bailed him out. And uh, forgive me, Chris, but I'm about to say this. Maybe Justin Wilson can be that lefty. We've talked about this for the last couple of weeks is uh, David Bell doesn't have a Southpaw that he can trust. Could Justin Wilson be that guy? And he hasn't pitched a ton since coming over from the Yankees, but he's been okay. I definitely wouldn't say he's a surefire uh, lefty option, but if he's going to come in and bail guys out with ground balls, something that we've said the the bullpen has had trouble giving up. They, they've they given up a lot more fly balls than ground balls ever since the trade deadline. I really think that Justin Wilson could be a dude there. I'd, I'd like to see more from him, though, before I go too far and say that. But I, I think that overall that was a nice performance and a good development. Hopefully the Reds have a lefty option out of the bullpen coming up, but they get a win and they're heading down to Miami where I was about to say better weather, but at this point it's probably like super crazy humid or something. I don't know. I've never been to Miami. I've been to Orlando and Tampa, but I've never been to Miami. So it it could be really nice, but they're going to play the Marlins, which is really nice because they dominated them at great American. And they've got Wade Miley on the mound tonight to start another series. We'll break that all down here in a little bit, though, because I want to get into some Reds chasing awards and where they stand with that. Before we get into that, though, I want you to get into a Built Bar. Go to Built.com and use that promo code LOCKED15. You'll save $15 off your next order. I've always said BuiltBar.com. If you type that in, it'll take you to the right URL, but it's Built.com. And you can check out all the great flavors that they've got. They've got Cherry Barcia. I tried to eat a Grasshopper cookie bar yesterday on the pod, and it's not because it wasn't great. It was because it was too good that it didn't really work out. So I'm not going to do that anymore. I promise that won't happen anymore. But you should absolutely get on built.com and order yourself some built bars because they are made with 100% real chocolate. And the stats are amazing with less than four grams of sugar. We're talking about four grams or less of fat and up to 18 grams of protein, not to mention only like 120, 130 calories. They fit into just about any diet you can think of, including keto. Check them out today at built.com and use that promo code lock 15 to save 15% off your next order. I love built bar and I think you will too. Use that promo code locked 15. All right. So there's actually a couple of guys in some races and preseason. I would not have thought that the reds had a person who was really going to challenge for rookie of the year. I thought that Jonathan India looked, you know, interesting, but I did not expect him to be this good. And if you ask me, and if you ask Vegas, because I can't find, I mean, maybe there's something, I mean, betonline.ag doesn't have one, but maybe there's another website out there that might have this. I didn't see any odds on currently NL rookie of the year candidates. That leads me to believe Jonathan India is the odds on favorite. I mean, he's been phenomenal, nothing short of phenomenal all season long. He's actually in the top 10. Like if you look at National League uh, on base stats, he's in the top 10 of that. That's not just rookies. That's everybody. I think he's eighth in on base percentage for the entire National League. He has been absolutely phenomenal. The slugging has really come along as of late. So he's rounded himself out into a very good hitter. Talking about, depending on where you look, on fan graphs, he has a little bit more war. On baseball reference, he's got 2.7 wins above replacement. Just a phenomenal year. I want to do a segment. I didn't plan this for today, but in a later or in a podcast down the road, I, I'd kind of like to compare him to other Reds rookies. I'd be interested to see how he stacks up through the rookie performances that the Reds have seen in their long story franchise history. But Jonathan India has been phenomenal. And I love how gritty he is, how hard he plays. You can tell that he wants to be out there. There's not a situation that Jonathan India is just like, yeah, you know, I think I might kick back with a Gatorade here on the bench. Like, I mean, he got blasted in the wrist with that pitch on Wednesday, and it actually kind of hurts my wrist even just thinking about it. And I think this isn't even the right wrist because I'm a lefty and he's a righty. So whatever. Anyway, he absolutely looked like he could have stayed out of that game, but he was determined to be there for his team. And he's been so phenomenal for the Reds all year long. Kind of mentioned he's gone through that mini slump. He hopefully broke out of it yesterday. We'll see what he can do. He he liked that Marlins series. We'll see if he can get him some more 
this weekend down in Miami, but I, I got to believe. I know that Trevor Rogers has had a nice year, but he's been dealing with a lot of injuries. I know that there's been some other dudes like, I mean, you, you kind of think of Jazz Chisholm, you think of Lars Newtbar, who, I mean, sure, he's got a great name, but he hasn't been better than Jonathan India. Dylan Carlson, Brian Hayes, all those guys have had nice seasons. Jonathan India has had a great season. And so long as he continues to stay healthy and produce at the level that he has all year long, I think he's going to take on that hardware. On the other side of the equation is the MVP race. And it's interesting because one dude, according to betonline.ag, is far and away favored, and that is Fernando Tatis. In fact, his odds right now, if you were to go bet on the impending National League uh, MVP, I almost said Cy Young again. I, I constantly say Cy Young. I got that stuck on the brain. But if you were to go bet on that at betonline.ag, Tatis is minus 350, which means they have him as a huge favorite. Joey's on there. He's at plus 1200 and, uh, Castellanos is on there as well. He's at the bottom of the list. So they've got about like eight names that you can bet on. He's at the bottom at plus 5,000. That injury really kind of set him back so far as the MVP race is concerned, but he's still tied for the NL batting title right now with Trey Turner. Both of them have a 320 average. Would love to see if Castellanos can finish the season with that batting title. You look at Joey Votto, he's tied for third in the National League in home runs. He's behind Tatis. Tatis has 35, and then Pete Alonso has 29, and Joey, I think it's Freddie Freeman. No, Bryce Harper have 28 home runs on the season. So I'm not sure that either one of those guys can eclipse what Tatis has done because You have the success that the Padres have had. Yes, I know that the Reds are ahead of them, which we love. Now, two games ahead because the Padres got swept by the Dodgers at home. Uh, That was was a rough series for them, but the Reds are now two games ahead of them for the second wild card spot. And there's two schools of thought. There's the best player, and there's the best... um, I I forgot these pictures. Look at this. I got this great Joey Votto picture. But when it comes to Joey and when it comes to Nick Castellanos and their arguments for MVP over Fernando Tatis, I think the biggest thing that they've got going for them is the success of their team and how important they have been. I mean, Castellanos has been on a home run tear here recently, and Joey Votto, I mean, we all know how good he's been. He's been on a little bit of a downswing over the last week or so. I think that he's going to pick it back up though. And I mean, he's just been so much far and away better than we thought he was going to be this year. I just love the fact that we're even talking about this, that he is in the MVP conversation at the age of 37. I think, I mean, if you remember back to some of my off season podcasts and maybe uh, if you weren't listening back then, I, I had this thought that maybe the Reds should think about a platoon at first base, like do like Tyler Stevenson against lefties, Joey against righties and things like that. Joey has proved all of that wrong. I mean, he's still hitting lefties pretty well and he's hitting everybody else amazingly. So you're not, I, I, the, the fact that I even thought that in the off season now, it just makes me laugh, but that's where we were over the last couple of years. So the fact that he's played this well in 2021 is just a testament to how good he is. And Castellanos, I mean, the odds at plus 5,000, you could put a little bit of money on that. And if he were to sneak up and win it, I just think that Tatis, and especially depending on how the Padres finish, Tatis has a really good argument because they're such a good team when he's there. And when he's out of the lineup, they are, they're an okay team. It, it's not as if one guy in the sport of baseball makes a team i.e. the Angels and Mike Trout, and now the the Angels and Shohei Otani since Mike Trout's been out for most of the year. But one guy doesn't make a team, but with as decent of a lineup as they put together, when you add Tatis to it, it just takes it to a whole nother level. And when you take him out, they're just okay. So I understand why he is the favorite, but I do think Joey and Castellanos have a puncher's chance in this race. And plus 5,000, that's a little bit of an interesting value you might want to take a look at. Before we take a look at tonight's pitching matchup, I want you to take a look. I, I've been talking about it a little bit, betonline.ag, and you can use the promo code Locked On, like I got right here on the screen. Right point, point there. Yep. You can use that promo code to get 50% added onto your initial deposit. 
and you can start getting off the bench and getting in the game and making some money off your sports knowledge today. I gave you the tip yesterday, which was barely before first pitch. So if you guys got the chance to utilize it, you're welcome. And if not, I'm sorry I was late. Today, I'm giving you a little bit more of a notice, and I'm giving you the same bet. Yesterday, I said the Reds team total over four and a half. Take it. Today, their over-under is set at four and a half. Take it. I know, and we'll talk about Zach Thompson in a minute. Thompson kind of limited the damage that the Reds did against him, but it's about doing like one or two runs of damage against him, and then whenever they get into that Marlins bullpen, they can get some more runs up on the board. I think five runs is an easy bet, and it's currently at plus 100. So if you put 10 bucks down, you win 10 bucks if they score five runs or more. I think that's a given. Go take the Reds team total over four and a half at plus 100 today at betonline.ag. And if you're brand new, set up your profile with the promo code locked on to get 50% added onto your initial deposit. All right. So one, uh, let's talk about game one down in Miami, the Marlins and the Reds. And we've got the man Wade Miley, which if you look at baseballreference.com, he's currently sitting at 5.9 wins above replacement. Now, fan graphs is a little bit more tougher on pitchers than baseball references. Fan graphs has him at 2.9, but fan graphs still has him as the Reds best pitcher this year. He's been so phenomenal. I mean, whether you look at the stats and you see that 2.8 ERA and you see the different numbers that he's got otherwise, like it's been probably the best year of his career. We'll have to see how September goes because as you remember, in 2019, he was pitching phenomenally through the month of August for the Astros. And we talked about this whenever the Reds acquired Wade Miley, the month of September blew up in his face. He had like a 16 ERA in the month of September in 2019. So what's he going to give the Reds this year? We'll have to keep an eye on that, but he's got one more start here in the month of August and he's going up against the team that he faced in his last outing. Last time he pitched, he pitched against the Marlins and ironically enough, he pitched against Zach Thompson. So it's like deja vu, except in Florida, which just means there's more humidity. So with Wade Miley, the way that that start went wasn't quite as planned. In fact, most of the year, he's been a lot better. The fifth inning, he couldn't get out of. And part of it was control, but another part of it, I was going back and I was watching it on the MLB film room and I was seeing the at bat against Miguel Rojas. This was after Thompson had laid down a sack bunt to get it to runners on second and third with two outs. You had Miguel Rojas up. Wade Miley was actually making good pitches. He got robbed on strike one. The very first pitch was in the zone, low and inside in the zone, but the umpire didn't give him the strike. Then the second pitch was borderline. It's out over the plate, but it was a little bit low. Looked like the top edge of the baseball might have grazed where the little box on the screen is. And you could have argued that that was a strike, but quickly he was down two and zero in the count. And from then the count got worked to full and he ended up walking Rojas. Then he ended up hitting jazz Chisholm to bring in a run. And then he walked Jesus Aguilar to bring in another run. He wasn't giving up hits. I mean, there was a double and then everything else were singles against him. So, and, and there wasn't hard contact. So it was kind of the quintessential Wade Miley start until the fifth when he started walking guys. And I'm not going to sit here and make excuses saying the umpire was bad and that's why Wade Miley was bad. But when you look at how that at bat went, the Miguel Rojas at bat changed the entire game for Wade Miley because if he gets out of that, if he gets Rojas to strike out, pop up, ground out, whatever, he's out of that inning and he's probably pitching the sixth. But instead, he doesn't even make it through the fifth. He doesn't even qualify for the decision, which is neither here nor there. But that's just to show you how weird that rule is, but also to show you how weird of a night that was for Wade Miley. And at the time, those two runs tied the game. It's just the Marlins went to the bullpen in the sixth and the Reds killed Anthony Bender and ended up winning the game, which we were happy about. So I I look at this and I say he's got a chance to bounce back against the same team that he had a bit of a rough night against. And when you look at him on the road, he has been a little bit worse than at home, which is oddly enough, like he gives up six home runs on the road compared to four at home. You think that would be the opposite with great American, but you know, here we are. And on the road, he has a 3.39 ERA in 11 starts. So yeah, not as good as at home, but that's still pretty good. That's still right where you want him to be. He has allowed a lot less hits on the road, 54 
compared to 70 at home, but most of those have turned into more runs. It's, it, it's kind of weird how that's all worked more hits at home, less runs allowed and vice versa on the road. So we'll see what he can do against this Marlins lineup here tonight down in Miami. On the other side of the equation is Zach Thompson. And Zach Thompson, uh, in his outing against the Reds last time, was actually pretty good at limiting hard contact and getting swings and misses on his cut fastball and his curveball, which has been his MO all year long. If you look at his profile on Baseball Savant, those are his two best pitches. He throws his cut fastball the most, his curveball is about the third most percentage of the time. He's a five-pitch guy, which is pretty impressive. But overall, it all works into a pretty league average pitcher. He gives up league average stuff when it comes to exit velocity. He's got a league average strikeout rate, league average walk rate. He's got some nice expected statistics. They're a little bit better than league average. But overall, it also says he's getting a little bit lucky with his ERA. His XFIP is above four. So when you see that ERA below three and you see the XFIP above four, regression is coming. Hopefully the Reds can be that regression. Uh, Whenever it came to that last start, the cut fastball and the curve, as I mentioned, were dominant. The Reds hit the four-seamer. In fact, that was the home run that Castellanos hit off of him was the four-seam fastball. And and really, it all comes down to the fact that he's a high spin rate pitcher, but everything else just kind of... I don't know, like I'm still learning about spin rate and things like that. I understand the numbers and the higher number, the better the spin rate, but then spin efficiency is a little bit over my head. I might have to have our buddy Matt Wilkes from uh, Reds Content Plus on here to educate me. But when I look at the numbers for Thompson, I'm thinking that the Reds have a shot to get some runs early in this one, maybe two or three runs while he's in the ball game and get a couple more runs whenever the bullpen comes in. Like I said, take that team over four and a half at betonline.ag at plus 100. It'll pay out some money. All right, that'll do it for us here today. Thank you so much for watching here on YouTube, for listening on your favorite podcasting app. If you are not already subscribed right here on YouTube, make sure you do that. If you're not following on your favorite podcast app, make sure you're doing that as well because I've got all kinds of great content for you the rest of this way. We're in the stretch run. The Reds are two games ahead of the San Diego Padres for the second spot in the National League wild card. Yes, we don't want them to lose, but if they lose one game, they're still going to be in the wild card no matter what. That's kind of nice. We'll see how they can fare against this Marlins team this weekend. I'll be all over it on Twitter. You can follow me at Jeff Carr with three Fs, and you can follow the show at Locked On Reds and save that Locked On Reds line number into your phone at 513-549-0159. But for now, I hope you guys have a great weekend. We'll talk to you on Monday. Hopefully, we'll be talking about a series win that begins with this guy. I got a picture of Wade Miley on here if you're not watching on YouTube. But anyway, talk to you guys later.